Good morning. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are beginning our work uh, this Thursday morning on um, Prop 2, uh, which is a proposal to amend the Constitution. Um, and what I would like to do is first invite um, Legislative Council Amarin Averjali to share with us the um, the text of the proposed constitutional amendment and uh, and then maybe remind the committee briefly, I think we're all somewhat familiar with this, but remind folks who might be following along outside for the first time um, what the process is of amending the constitution of the state of Vermont. So welcome, Amarin. Good morning, everyone. For the record, Amarin Abergele, Legislative Council. I'm looking at our posted materials today and I'm realizing I do not have a copy of Proposition 2 on here. Uh, so just a moment. Let me, yep, let me I am guessing I that. Um, could you describe where? Um, where so, Andrea might find it to, to put it up on our page. I will say that there is, um, I will send a link to Andrea also, but there, if you go into the document overview of proposal two, and you click into that document, you'll see at the very top, it says overview of proposal two as proposed by the Senate. If you click that link, it will take you directly to uh, the document so we can walk through it from there. So you'll see I have a couple of materials that were actually prepared by my predecessor, uh, Betsy Ann Rask, because this um, has been going on since the previous biennium. So a lot of those materials are carrying over. And rather than reinvent the excellent wheel uh, that Betsy Ann made, I am sharing those materials with you <clears throat> today. So looking at uh, the proposed amendment to the Constitution of the State of Vermont, Proposal 2. You have the first section, this proposal would amend the Constitution of the State of Vermont to clarify that slavery and indentured servitude in any form are prohibited. And then Section 2, Article 1 of Chapter 1 of the Vermont Constitution is amended to read. You'll see the added into the title of the article uh, and indentured servitude as also prohibited in addition to slavery. And then the paragraph in Article 1 will now read uh, that all persons are born equally free and independent and have certain natural, inherent, and unalienable alienable rights, amongst which are the enjoying and defending life and liberty, acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. Therefore, slavery and indentured servitude in any form are prohibited. Moving into section three on page two, effective date, the amendment set forth in section two shall become part of the constitution of the state of Vermont on the first Tuesday after the first Monday of November, 2022, when ratified and adopted by the people of this state in accordance with the provisions of title 17, chapter 32. Excellent. Questions from committee members? All right, so I think next what I'd like to do is invite um, Peter Teachout, who is a professor at Vermont Law School and, and joined us uh, when we moved this um, constitutional amendment in the previous biennium. Uh, to share with us uh, some context and history around um, this question of um, uh, prohibiting slavery in the Vermont Constitution. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay. I prepared a very brief PowerPoint. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to pull it up. I see a little share screen thing down at the bottom of the screen. If I click that, would that allow me to bring up the PowerPoint for my presentation this morning? Um, it would if we make you co-host. Um, so we can certainly do that. And you are now co-host. And so you should be able to click that button and find the PowerPoint on your desktop to share with us. Okay, let's see if I can find the PowerPoint then. How about this one right here? Okay, and now share. There we go. Can you see it? We can, thank you. Okay. 
Hold on just a second. There we go. <clears throat> okay, uh, it's really a privilege to be, be able to meet with the committee this morning. My testimony is going to consist of two basic points. I'm not sure they will be welcome, but I am going to make them. The first point is running a little bit counter to, I think, this current right out there, is that it's not necessary to amend Article 1 in order to make clear that under the Vermont Constitution, slavery has always been prohibited, not just adult slavery, but slavery period. I'm gonna make that point in my presentation this morning. The second point I would like to make, and it's a very simple one, which is if you want to amend the constitution, you think it's important to do so, then I think the proposed language is the best way, the clearest and the cleanest way to do it. So if I could proceed with my PowerPoint presentation as a basis for my comments, uh, there are just 11 slides, um, I can elaborate on those points. Why don't we start then with the language of Article 1 of Chapter 1 as it appeared in the Vermont Constitution of 1777. The very first words are that all persons are born equally free and independent and have certain natural, inherent, and unalienable rights. And the question is, did that include people who had been brought into the state as slaves? I don't know of anyone who claims the framers did not intend to include those who had been brought into the state as slaves as persons within the meaning of this provision. We tend to somehow jump over that and go to the complicating language, but this language is absolutely key that the framers of the Vermont Constitution wanted to include within the meaning of all persons, slaves, indentured servants, all persons. And the, and the basic proposition was, is that all persons are born equally free and independent and have certain natural inherent and alienable rights. It doesn't make a distinction between minors and adults, it's all persons. Now, the second point, which is also important, is that in 1802, still <laughs> during this period when the Constitution was, had first been adopted, the Vermont Supreme Court held, our Constitution is express. No inhabitant of the state can hold a slave. Didn't say no inhabitant of the state can hold an adult slave. It said no inhabitant of the state can hold a slave. And it went on to say that if anybody comes into the state and brings with him or her a bill of sale for a slave, whatever legal effect that bill might have in other states, quote, the bill of sale ceases to operate here. Now that had important implications, okay? How was it interpreted in practice? It is true that subsequent to the adoption of Article I, some people brought slaves into the state and kept them as slaves here. And we are indebted to the research that Professor Whitfield has done to show us instances where that in fact happened. Some people brought into the state bills of sale claiming to vest ownership in, the sl in, uh, in slaves. That's also true. But I will tell you, I have not been able to find a single court decision at any level in Vermont in which the court was asked to uphold and enforce a bill of sale for a slave and upheld and enforced a bill of sale for a slave. And that was true no matter what the age of the slave was. The courts just weren't gonna do it because those bills of sale were not legally operable in the state as the Supreme Court had said. So we can arrive at, I think, there are sound <laughs> conclusions. One, the Vermont state constitution was the first state to ban slavery, not just adult slavery, but slavery period. 
to that slaves brought into the state were considered persons within the meaning of Article I. There's no indication that anybody ever thought otherwise. And three, whatever the actual practice on the part of a few Vermonters, no inhabitant of the state could legally hold a slave, a slave and any bill of sale ceased to operate in Vermont the minute it entered the state. So I think this is sound. I, I don't know that there's any disagreement about that, although I may be surprised. So what's the source of confusion? Look, Article One goes on to provide, therefore no person born in this country or brought from overseas ought to be holden by law to serve any person as a servant, slave, or apprentice after arriving to a certain age for males, certain age for females, unless bound by the person's own consent. What's that provision all about? It's primarily about the institution of involuntary servitude. What do we know about it? We know that indentured servants, indentured, ser it's not in involuntary servitude, I misspoke, indentured servitude. Indentured servitude was widespread in the colonies and in the new states after the Declaration of Independence. In some parts of the country, indentured servants made up more than half the workforce. <laughs> why did this happen, okay? It happened, why not bond, ban involuntary servitude entirely? Because it had proved to be a mutually beneficial arrangement for both employers and workers. Workers, the indentured servants got free passage to this country, something they otherwise couldn't afford, passage underwritten in many cases by the ship owner in return for committing to a period of labor, often taking the form, but not always of an apprenticeship without formal compensation. The problem was it was subject to abuse. In some cases, the contract of indentured servitude extended until a person was 30 or older. So something had to be done with it. But in general, it was an arrangement from which everyone benefited. Okay. How does Article I seek to deal with potential abuse? Simple. It just put a limit on the number of years that a contract for indentured servitude could be legally enforced without the individual's own consent. A number set for when males reached 21, females reached 18. After that, they were free as a matter of state constitutional law to make their own arrangements. So that was the basic, that's what that language is all about. So then that raises this question. Why include slaves in that second part of the article. I will tell you, we don't have a definitive answer to that and probably never will. Remember the first state constitution was hammered out over a weekend basically down in Windsor and then everybody rushed off to defend the state against the British. So, but it seems reasonable to conclude that if this provision had not been explicitly included within its protections, those who had been brought into the state as slaves, a slave owner might claim, this provision doesn't apply to me. I don't have to let my slaves go when they reach a certain age because this provision only applies to servants and apprentices. So the purpose of putting slavery in there, and we don't know exactly how it got in there, it was not to endorse child slavery, but to cut off the ability of anyone who may have, like Jacobs, who may have brought a slave into the state from using omission of slaves from this provision as an excuse for not complying with it. That's a sensible interpretation. I think it's probably the accurate one. So let's face this question squarely. Is there any evidence that in adopting Article One, the framers wish to give constitutional sanction to child slavery? I'm gonna speak bluntly. The answer is no, period. And I will tell you that if anyone says the Vermont framers wish to give constitutional sanction to child slavery, or even we're complacent with doing so, they are just blowing smoke. That is not reflected in the history of this provision. Such an interpretation would have run directly counter to the view expressed in Windsor versus Jacobs 
that no inhabitant of the state can hold a slave, and that any bill of sale for a slave would not be legally enforceable in the courts of the state. So people kind of get all tied up about Windsor versus Jacobs because Jacobs happened to be a member of the Supreme Court at the time the court made that decision. So let's just spend just one minute with that. In ruling as the Vermont Supreme Court did in Windsor versus Jacobs were the two justices who joined that opinion, just trying to provide cover for Jacobs, who at the time was also a member of the court. Well, I will tell you what the answer to that is. There's no evidence that the principles expressed by this decision were not genuinely held by the two justices who joined it. Not a stroke of it. Every evidence that we have indicates that these are principles that they genuinely were committed to, that they felt were embodied in the Vermont Constitution. There's no evidence that the view expressed in the justice's opinion was not widely shared in the state, not uniformly shared, but not widely shared. There's in fact no evidence that the two justices who joined in the opinion liked or respected Jacobs. There's some suggestion that they didn't, that they thought he was a little bit of a re reprehensible character. And four, they had many other ways of nullifying the contract other than issuing an opinion that clearly wasn't intended as a condemnation of slavery and approach and a reproach to Jacobs for his conduct in bringing into the state and holding a slave. That all of that is very clear from the history. Okay. I'll give you a simple way they could have done it. So what did Jacobs do? He brought a slave into the state, a young woman, kept her, exploited her while he could. And when she became sick and infirm as an older woman, he dumped her out on the street and let the local select board take care of her under some provision dealing with taking care of the poor. That's what he did, okay? So what's another way the court have handled it if they wanted to take care of their buddy Jacobs, protect him, let him off the hook? What happened was the board of selectmen brought the bill of sale in and say, hey, look, this is Jacob's slave. And the court said, that contract is not enforceable. We're not gonna recognize it. Okay, what's another way the court could have ruled? If they had wanted to protect Jacob's, but they really didn't, they thought that, that uh, slavery of minors was perfectly permissible, per permissible. They could have said, hey, Jacob's, you had a legal right to bring a minor into the state as a slave. They didn't say that. But once she turned 18, any contract you had was no longer operable. It was null and void because of this provision in Article I. They didn't say that. Instead, they wrote an opinion that condemned the institution of slavery, that made clear that the Vermont Constitution banned slavery across the board, and that reproached Jacob for having brought this woman into, a, into the state. I, and I, I think they were, they found him something of a reprehensible character because of his conduct in treating this woman when she no longer was usable to him. So general conclusions, no need to amend article one of chapter one of the Vermont constitution to make clear that it's a constitutional matter. There's no place for slavery in the state. That has been true from the very beginning. It has been the consistent view of the Vermont Supreme Court and the consistent view of virtually anybody who has ever considered it. Two, if you amend Article I in the way contemplated, not a big deal maybe, but you'll be losing not the history itself, but the conscious awareness of that history and why we should be proud of that history, why we should be proud of being the first state in the union ever to ban slavery across the board. You'll be losing not the history, but the conscious awareness of it. Three, but if you feel you have to do it, the proposed language of the amendment is probably the best, the cleanest way to do so. And I have spoken with this committee before about a possible justification for doing it, which is that long as that language remains in the constitution, it will be kind of a little bit of a thorn in the side 
of the political life in the state, because some people will continue to read it as somehow sanctioning the slavery of those who are not adults. It doesn't do that, but some people may read it that way. So if you feel that the political costs of keeping the language in the way that it is written outweigh the political benefits of doing so and the historical benefits of doing so, if you want to do it, proposed amendment, probably the best and the cleanest way to do so. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've gotten that off my chest this morning. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for being with us this morning. Um, let's go off screen share and I'll give committee members a moment to um, to raise their hand if they have any questions for you. So if you can click stop screen share, that will allow us to come back to the virtual room here together. I would love to do that if I, but you've got to help me find, what if I get, let me just, can I get rid of I can't find the little green thing at the bottom of my screen anymore, but maybe I can by watch. I'm going to probably disappear now. Hold on. We'll, we'll bring you it's, back if you do. Okay. It's at the top of your screen now, uh, Professor. You okay, should be well, able to stop share and be at the top. Or, which one? Resume share, new share, what? Uh, at the top of your screen, you should see stop screen share. Stop. I wish I could. Stop share. There we go. Now we're back in committee. Thank you so much. Um, committee members, any questions for Professor Teachout? Uh, Representative Anthony. Is this language whole cloth construction uh, and with no connection to the Pennsylvania document from which uh, a great deal of ours was lifted? That's interesting, um, um, Representative Anthony. We did lift a great deal of language, but this provision was unique. The, 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 the framers who met in Windsor did make a handful of changes to the Pennsylvania model that they relied on. And this provision is unique in this respect. Pennsylvania constitution did not ban slavery. Thank you. I think it makes a, a difference to our interpretation that this, this particular article was whole cloth. Thanks. Representative LeClaire. Thank you, Madam Chair. And good morning, Professor Teachout. Thank you for being here. Um, I know you've weighed in on this topic several times. I'm just curious, um, when you spoke to us the first time here a year or two ago for this COVID pandemic, I sort of lost track myself. Um, has this been your consistent position from the very beginning as to where you are today? Thank you, Representative LeClaire, for catching me out. <laughs> I have vacillated on this issue from the first time I testified to the second and then back again today. I have, I'm just a human being. I don't think my own position about what's the right course ought to weigh that much on you. I can give you the history and that's where I, I hope you respect my expertise, but I really have vacillated. So I think the last time I testified, now back in 2019, I said, you know, initially I was opposed to this amendment but I'm coming around to the position that maybe it will just clear the slate, get rid of all the noise and the flack. And so let's just go ahead and do it. And as you can see from my testimony today that I've kind of gone back on the other side of the teeter-totter <laughs> and now I'm feeling, God damn it, it would be such a shame to lose, that, lose sight of that history because it is not necessary. So you... Thank you for catching me. Well, that was absolutely not my intent, sir, but um, <laughs> thanks for answering the question. Any other questions from committee members? All right, thank you, Professor Tuchat. I would welcome you to stick around. You'll, uh, you'll hear some uh, other viewpoints and other thoughts on this as well. Um, so next I'd like to go to uh, Reverend Mark Hughes, um, he's here with the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance, and I believe he has a couple of 
uh, colleagues with him. And so, uh, Mark, I would welcome you to uh, introduce yourself and the folks you have with, it, with you and let us know um, who you would like to have speak first. And uh, we'll move through our next set of witnesses. Good morning. Absolutely. Good morning uh, to you, Madam Chair. For the record, uh, I am uh, Reverend Mark Hughes with the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance and Justice for All. I have with me a few folks, some great folks. Um, I have uh, the Executive Director of the uh, Vermont Innovative Action and a good friend of mine, uh, Debbie Ingram. Woo, woo, woo. Uh, I um, would just, I would just add that it was Debbie. She was the original um, senator that put this put this uh, proposal forward uh, back a couple of years ago. That was just um, the year after you had H25, um, uh, HR25 in your committee. HR25, for those of you who are still here at that time, in 2018 was a resolution that we were asking you to put forward to urge the 2019 Senate to take up this proposal that unfortunately never made it out of your committee. Uh, so the, the following year, uh, th that's what uh, Senator Ingram did. She, she did put forward that proposal. I also have the Reverend Dr. Arnold I. Thomas uh, with the Good Shepherd Lutheran Church of Jericho, who's also a board member of the foundation. Uh, he's with us. And I also have um, Max Parthis, who is uh, this, on the state coordinating committee, amongst other things, uh, and, which I don't have time to tell you all about. Oh, uh, the state coordinating committee of our national partners, the Abolished Slavery National Network. Uh, so I'm excited to, to be here and with you and I'm looking for my notebook. If, if you could just bear with me for about 30 seconds, looking for my notebook. Thank you, I found it. So uh, this is the, uh, this is proposal two, uh, Declaration of Rights Clarifying the Prohibitions uh, on Slavery and Indentured Servitude. Today um, is, is actually a pretty big deal. A uh, pretty big deal today. That's why I, that's why I wore my my nice suit jacket, Madam Chair. Uh, I, this is a really big deal, uh, being at this uh, being at this place. Uh, this, in fact, may be one of the most consequential um, things that this committee ever takes up or has done, at least to date, uh, because the work actually dates back to a national story, not just a state story. Although the state predates the nation, which is relevant because when we talk about anything that the state is doing, um, it essentially informed the nation. Um, the purpose of this proposal was originally, the original purpose of the proposal was to eliminate slavery. Uh, and uh, it was to uh, to do so, I think what we started with is this eliminated reference to slavery, which was an interesting conversation uh, to be having. And it caused some, as you all recall, some uh, interesting um, interactions, you know, even amongst ourselves, we couldn't even agree on what that meant. Um, and though our understanding of the need to amend the Constitution, it has changed. Uh, we, we know now more than ever uh, that Vermont must be clear in her position that slavery is prohibited, period. So the 13th Amendment of the United States Constitution states neither, it says, um, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except for the punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Which means when the ink dried <clears throat> in 1865, we moved as a nation from a nation of shadow slavery to a nation of prison slavery. And we've been that ever since. That's what the 13th Amendment means. 
And it means the same thing to all 50 states, to include Vermont. Now, the Vermont Constitution, as I said earlier, it predates the 13th Amendment, as well as the United States Constitution, which permitted slavery without exception. And instead, our Constitution, what it does, it offers, I used to say two, but I'm going to say three. So the professor is not the only one vacillating here. So I move from two to three. These are um, exception clauses uh, in this Constitution for those under the age of 21 years. It used to be 18 for women and 21 for men, but someone found grace in, in, in 1924 and decided to make them all 21 because I guess that was better. The second point, the second exception clause is, is for a, per, uh, a person's own consent. I would imagine there might be circumstances under which a person would give one's own consent for being a slave I don't know when those would be, but it's yet an exception clause. Uh, and then the other one is, is if bound by law for payment, debts, damages, fines, costs, or the like, which translates after 1865 to the criminalization of poverty. But we'll come back to that. The Vermont Constitution, it also fails to, um, to negate the crime exception clause in the, in, in the United States Constitution. It fails to negate that, unlike a, a few other states that are starting to do that. So, so we are not the only we're not the only states that are abolishing slavery. There are those are that are before us, and Max Parthas will come and tell you more about that what's happening on the national level. <clears throat> so, the constitutional uh, amendment purpose language approved by the Senate in 2019 is really simple. It just says this proposal would amend the Constitution of the state of Vermont to clarify that slavery and indentured servitude in any form are prohibited. With only one dissent of 180 legislators, this proposal arrives to you to complete the legislative process of this landmark constitutional amendment. This is it. The Senate has, has, has voted on this and has made a statement twice with one dissent. You voted on this previously unanimously. No dissent. Now we're back. It is vitally important that we acknowledge that for nearly 245 years, slavery has been prohibited only after arriving at the age of 21 years, unless bound by the person's own consent after arriving at such age, or bound by the law for the payment of debts, damages, fines, costs, or the like. It's the Constitution. More importantly, during this process, now is the time for us to accept Vermont's role in laying the groundwork for the incorporation of slavery into the United States Constitution and our silence on the matter of the exception clause of the 13th Amendment for the last 157 years. Slavery and indentured servitude in any form are prohibited. That is what we're asking you to do. <clears throat> In the Bellagio Harvard guidelines on the legal parameters of slavery, the research network on legal parameters of slavery stated that slavery is the status or condition of a person over whom any or all powers attaching to the right of ownership are exercised. Ownership, ownership, think about that. Do we wanna be a state that ascribes to owning people? 
Forget about what's in the Constitution right now. Maybe the professor had some points. Who knows? Let's talk about the 13th Amendment, because the language that we're placing in this Constitution completely negates the 13th Amendment and says definitively that slavery under any circumstance is prohibited. That is all. End of conversation. United Nations, the Human Rights Council, there was a report of a working group of experts of people of African descent on its mission to the United States in 2016. You can read it. This is what they quoted. There is a profound need to acknowledge that the transatlantic trade in African enslavement, colonization, colonialism were a crime against humanity and are among major sources and manifestations of racism, racial discri discrimination, Afrophobia, xenophobia, and related intolerance. It goes on to say that past injustices and crimes against African Americans, quote, need to be addressed with reparatory justice. That's the United Nations. Now, I know H-478 hung on the wall last year for two years when we started to talk about reparations, and we know that the 378 is on the wall in house right now, and there's a preferred conversation that's more palatable that we'd, that we'd rather dis discuss truth and reconciliation. We'll talk about that later. Despite substantial changes since the end of enforcement of Jim Crow and the fight for civil rights, a systemic ideology of racism ensuring the domination of one group over another continues to impact negatively. Civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights of African Americans today, the same report from the United Nations. In 2021, there was an annual report from the United Nations High Commissioner. And she said this, one, systemic racism often manifests itself in pervasive racial stereotypes, prejudice and bias, and is frequently rooted in histories and legacies of enslavement and transatlantic trade of enslaved Africans and colonialism. She went on to say systemic racism persists in large part due to misconception that the abolition of slavery, the end of transatlantic trade in enslaved Africans and colonialism and measures taken by states to date have removed the racially discriminatory structures built by those practices and created equal societies. And finally, she goes on to say, the dehumanization of people of African descent, a practice rooted in false social constructions of race historically created to justify enslavement, pervasive racial stereotypes and widely accepted harmful practices and traditions has sustained and cultivated a tolerance for racial discrimination, inequity, and violence. We stated in our original proposal, the purpose of this work was to quote, serve as a foundation for addressing systemic racism in our state's laws and institutions. In your R133 last year, when you resolved that racism was a public health emergency, you said this legislative body commits to the sustained and deep work of eradicating systemic racism through the state actively fighting racist practices and participating in the creation of more just and equitable systems. This is the heart 
of that work. This is the heart of that work. In closing, I would say, it's unfortunate but true that in 2022, we are having a conversation in the state of Vermont about abolishing slavery. It's unfortunate, but it's true. America is having a conversation about abolishing slavery. And our friends from the National Abolish Slavery, that national network will tell you a little bit more about that. So yes, the language that, quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident is still aspirational in the United States of America in 2022. We are yet a nation of slavery. The truth is that Vermont has served as the linchpin to the institution of slavery in the United States and the sustainment of systemic racism as it is perpetrated, as it is perpetuated. Because of its historical position, its historical position on slavery, its historical position that it did not take on slavery and chronologically where it lies in history. That is where Vermont is. So historically, when we memorialize this and our children will, when we look back on this, this is a moment where we can say that for the first time in 245 years that Vermont has finally and definitively said that racism, that slavery is prohibited, slavery and indentured servitude are prohibited under all circumstances, hard stop, period. This will be our moment. This is our time. This is the beginning. This is not the end. This is where it starts. This is not where it stops. Because when we say dismantle systemic racism, that means we are making an earnest effort of starting. And what we're doing is we are now shaking it at its very foundation. And yes, there will be some who oppose. And no, it will not feel comfortable. But this is the work that we must do if we want to hold true to what it is that we've committed to do as a legislative body and what we know we must as people, as humans, as the United Nations tells us. Thank you for your time, Madam Chair. May God be with you all. Thank you for being with us this morning. Um, committee members, any questions before we go to our next witness? All right. Um, so uh, let's go next to Debbie Ingram, former Senator, and um, thank you for coming back to help see this through and, um, and for your work in launching this in the last biennium. Um, welcome and uh, uh, please share your thoughts on uh, the passage of this constitutional amendment. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And it really is a great uh, honor to be back among you and a pleasure. Um, so many familiar faces. I uh, appreciate the work that you're doing, um, especially um, during the pandemic and having to do everything on Zoom. Um, so for the record, I am uh, Debbie Ingram. I'm the executive director of Vermont Interfaith Action, which is a faith-based uh, coalition of over 70 member and affiliated uh, congregations uh, throughout uh, Vermont that work together on issues of social justice. Um, and I'm really speaking on behalf of about 16,000 uh, Vermonters of faith um, today. Uh, all across the state who strongly support uh, the passage of Prop 2, and uh, we urge you to, um, to vote to do that. Um, I think it's really important uh, with um, 
something, um, an issue like this, um, even though um, uh, historically there are, uh, there are nuances and there are reasons for the, um, for the language that uh, is uh, in the constitution now. I think it's just very important to, um, in our modern times, make, uh, make plain language um, that anybody can interpret simply. Um, that's really what Prop 2 is all about. It's, it's removing any, any doubt, any equivocation about how Vermonters today view the abominable institution of slavery. The idea of one person owning another person. Um, and that came about because they didn't view other people as people. They viewed them and they dehumanized um, them. And that legacy of slavery is what is causing the pain and polarization in our country today. Uh, we're, we're seeing the vestiges of it um, for, for the last several hundred years. And this is really an opportunity for, um, for you as, um, as a body um, and for all Vermonters uh, later this year to take a firm and uh, unequivocal stand that uh, we believe slavery is wrong and we view all people as truly uh, people, as humans who deserve to be treated with respect and dignity. Um, and so, you know, on the one hand, it's, it's, it's very, very simple. Uh, it's very, very straightforward. On the other hand, it uh, begins to address the incredible complications of, um, of what has been caused by, by slavery. And, you know, as Mark was saying, we, we have the opportunity then to go forward and look at ways to dismantle uh, the systemic racism that plagues us in so many areas, in, um, in economics, in healthcare, in education, um, just in, on and on. Uh, the, the systemic racism that, um, that has damaged not just people of color, uh, but has also um, harmed uh, uh, white people. Um, the, a system of oppression harms both the oppressor and the oppressed. And, um, and, it's, and all of this has helped to cause the polarization of, uh, uh, that we experience in our country. Um, so the members of Vermont Interfaith Action uh, look forward to, um, to uh, getting the word out to uh, other Vermonters uh, after you uh, pass this, if you do indeed um, pass it. And uh, we look forward to continuing the amendment process uh, to really call attention to the ways that we can do, uh, take further action to really ensure that uh, all people, um, regardless of their of their race uh, have uh, opportunities to, uh, to succeed in life, to thrive, um, to live the, the kind of life that, um, that our constitution promises, the Declaration of Independence promised, and that we believe God promises to every, every single person um, to pursue life, liberty, and, and, uh, and, the, and happiness uh, to, to have, a, have a, a good and decent life. Um, so, you know, there's, uh, you have a you have a big responsibility. You have a big opportunity uh, to to usher that in, and um, we um, we can support it more strongly. So I, I absolutely urge you to to vote in favor of it. And I uh, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for being with us this morning, committee. Any questions? All right. I'm not sure who you are handing off to. Um, we have uh, we have Max Parthas with us uh, as well. Oh, I'm as sorry, Madam Chair. Uh, we're we're going to go straight over to Reverend, Reverend Dr. Arnold Thomas. Great, Reverend sorry Thomas. Thank you for being with us this morning, and we would welcome you to uh, share your perspective on Prop Two. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for having me, and I, I'm honored to be here. And also in the company of such distinguished guests such as Reverend Mark Hughes and Debbie Ingram and uh, Professor Teachout. I uh, feel the need to go back to the language of the Constitution, of the Vermont Constitution, which says no male person born in this country or brought from overseas ought to be holden by law to serve any person as a servant, slave, or apprentice 
after he arrives to the age of 21 years for, uh, for uh, nor, nor female in the like manner after she arrives at the age of 18. As Reverend Hughes mentioned, that was amended later on. Unless they are bound by their own consent after they arrive to such age or bound by law for the payment of debts, damages, fines, costs, or the like. Personally, I discover that the loophole in this document enables those in control, specifically white men, to determine what constitutes legal fractures preventing human freedom. As a result, many prominent Vermonters were able to openly bend or abuse the law by holding slaves beyond the age they were to be emancipated. Professor Teachout mentioned Harvey Amani Whitfield, a former member of my congregation who now teaches at the University of Calvary in his book, The Problem of Slavery in Early Vermont. He reports that among those violating the abolition of slavery were Vermont Supreme Court Judge Supreme uh, Stephen Jacobs, whom Teachout mentioned, but also Levi Allen, the brother of uh, Ethan Allen, and Ethan Allen's daughter, who returned from Alabama with two enslaved members of her household and lived on the Allen homestead for several years before these enslaved individuals were emancipated. As long as the constitutional loophole remains, Vermont runs the risk, especially in this increasingly hostile national and state environment toward people of color, of returning to a contemporary Northern likeness of Jim Crow South after the abolishment of Reconstruction, where those in power, mainly white men, determined what constituted legal fractures preventing human freedom, especially the freedom of African-Americans, especially in our criminal justice system, and allowing laws to be established suppressing voting rights as we see occurring in many states within our nation today. We need to remember that when the Constitution, when the US Constitution was ratified on June 21st, 1788, only affluent, tax-paying, property-owning, adult white men were legally allowed to vote, which, by the way, constituted only 6% of the entire US population being allowed being legally allowed to vote. Only 6% of the US population when the constitution was ratified was allowed to vote. And these individuals were white, affluent, property owning, tax paying white men. Universal suffrage for all white men did not occur until 1858, when South Carolina abolished property requirements for voting. I'm sorry, North Carolina abolished property requirements for voting. Don't assume one moment that voter suppression is a moral travesty that affects only one segment of the population. It is a sin deeply woven into the fiber of this nation by a privileged racial minority. This loophole in the Vermont Constitution that has to be rectified, it has to be rectified immediately. But it is only the first step in the process of creating a common national measure and legislation that assures the freedom and suffrage of all Americans. That is a large, steep hill that Americans have yet to fully conquer. I'm going to close my remarks with that. 
Thank you, Reverend Thomas. Um, questions from committee members? All right, please, uh, please hang around with us. We may, uh, we may yet have uh, folks who'd like to ask questions of you. Um, Max Parthas is with us and um, Max for the benefit of folks who are following along from outside of our virtual committee room. Um, if you would uh, in your remarks, uh, share the contents or the at least the concepts of uh, some of the stuff that you have put in the chat um, because the chat is not part of uh, what gets streamed out live and uh, we don't want any uh, substantive um, exchange of information to go on there that we can't share with our friends who are following along. So uh, welcome and uh, please share your remarks on Prop 2. Uh, greetings, Madam Chair, uh, Co-Chair and esteemed committee. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak here today. My name is Max Parthas. I am the co-director for the state operations of the Abolish Slavery National Network. Uh, we are a group that are seeking to end constitutional slavery for all citizens under any circumstance. Uh, I want to talk about past, present, and future. Uh, so let's begin with the past. Um, Vermont likes to say that they were the first ones to uh, abolish slavery when the exact opposite is true. They were the ones who introduced the loophole which allowed for convict leasing. Um, and it influenced the constitutions of 25 states across the union, as well as the federal constitution. The first place that it reached was uh, Britain in 1779, where parliament enacted the Penitentiary Act, which introduced state prisons for the first time. The act was drafted by prison reformer John Howard and jurist William Blackstone, and it recommended imprisonment as an alternative sentence to death or transportation. The American colonies had been used as the destination for transported English criminals, and England was building prisons in America to provide a colonized workforce of European indentured servants, and only two were built in London. Um, that exception clause that was created by Vermont uh, was further taken up in 1787 by the Northwest Ordinance in another iteration. Then it showed up in 1806 in an Ohio state constitution. Following that, it entered the Oregon state constitution in 1843. And then uh, it went through uh, the Corwin Amendment in 61 and the Alabama state constitution in 61. And then in 62, it was included in an act for the release of certain persons held to service or labor in the District of Columbia, which was sponsored by Abraham Lincoln. And finally, we saw its last iteration in the U.S. Constitution in 1865, which says that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. I want to point out, first of all, that simply by having an exception to slavery within your state or federal constitution is a violation of international treaties and the International Declaration of Human Rights, Article 4, that states that slavery should not be allowed under any circumstances. Uh, so that is how our past began, uh, with Vermont leading the way. Uh, and it opened the door for what we knew after 1865 as convict leasing, which became a big industry in the United States. Uh, now I want to move on to the present. Vermont is not, as was mentioned, the only state that is involved in this effort. This is an international, I mean, a national effort with international implications. Uh, since 2018, four states uh, are listed as abolishing slavery with no exception. That's Rhode Island, Colorado, Nebraska, and Utah have already done it. In 2022, there are eight states, including yourself, who are on the ballot or moving towards the ballot to do exactly the same thing with 13 that have legislation in play already. Uh, Oregon and Tennessee is already on the ballot, uh, as you're seeking to do yourself. Alabama, California, Ohio, Vermont, and Florida will also be on the ballot, God willing that they make it through these committees in 2022. 
then in addition to that, there's another 15 states that are organizing as we speak to do the same. As we talk right now, there are two, uh, there's a joint federal resolution on the table to initiate a 28th amendment that will counter the exception clause of the 13th amendment. And these bills are getting wide support. Uh, I talked earlier in the chat room about convict leasing. It's the missing link that nobody seems to ever mention in regards to what's going on. In 1865, when slavery was allegedly abolished, what happened was they moved from the individual being able to own uh, people to the state taking over that job and owning people through these exception clauses, which were adopted by 25 states, one territory, and one district. And we don't think that is a coincidence at all. Uh, convict leasing went all the way up until 1928 in the United States when it was finally abolished due to a cave-in in Alabama that killed 128 Black men, women, and children who had been caught in this cave-in cave while mining and were there under convict leasing laws. We saw this thing escalate even more during the 1970s with the introduction of the war on drugs by uh, defamed and disgraced President uh, Richard Nixon. Uh, the war on drugs uh, started exploding our prison population and up into the 80s and 90s with the Clinton crime bill. Uh, we saw huge explosions then where people were being incarcerated all over the country at rates we had never seen before. In the United States right now, we have more black men behind bars in our prison systems than the top five populated African nations do combined. And we're not a black nation, and yet we have more black men behind bars than all five of them have combined at this point. And the uh, systemic racism is clearly evident. Nowhere in the union is there a state where white people are incarcerated at a higher rate than blacks, regardless of the population. In your own state, which has only a 1.2% Black population, you have an incarceration rate per 100,000 of 14 to 1, which is unacceptable. And in addition to this criminalization of entire communities and turning them into uh, commodities that can be worked or sold, you're also involved in human trafficking, where your inmates who committed no crime in other states are being shipped to other states simply because you don't have a prison there to put them in. Uh, and so they're being sent across state lines in human tra trafficking schemes uh, to put them in other prisons. Uh, now, we know that for-profit private prisons are a bad thing. Senator, uh, your senator there made uh, a, a note of pointing that out throughout his uh, campaign, uh, Senator Sanders. But what we don't realize is that for-profit prisons are one of the largest privately owned or uh, corporations on the entire planet. The GEO Group, for instance, is one, and another is G4S. G4S is listed as the third largest privately owned corporation on earth. Uh, and they are the largest employer on the entire continent of Africa right now. So our model of prison for profit has been adopted globally and being used in nations that don't have protections that we have. And so the human rights violations are absolutely astounding in places like Ghana, uh, for instance, where men sit in these cages knee to back because that's the only way they can fit in a prison that was built to hold 600 and currently holds 6,000. Uh, the Abolished Slavery National Network has been very successful in removing these uh, exception clauses. And we're going to continue to move forward to do it because this is a complete national effort, probably the largest coalition of states working on a single constitution, constitutional issue in our nation's history. Uh, now, as far as the future is concerned, it is our goal, as I said, to see these exception clauses removed from every state that has them and to also incorporate anti-slavery language in states that do not have any language whatsoever. We're doing that in places like Texas and New Jersey. And uh, I'm here to give you this information 
and hopefully that it will open your eyes on, about the circumstances to which we're dealing with right now. There is absolutely no reason for us to have an exception to slavery for any reason in any state constitution. And as I mentioned earlier, just by doing so, we're in violation of international treaties and Article 4 of the Declaration of Human Rights. Um, so with that being said, I will close out and say that please support this bill. We look forward to PR2 passing so that we can add Vermont to the list of states that do not have slavery in their state constitution anymore. Thank you very much. Thank you for being with us this morning. Um, committee members, any questions for Max Parthas? All right, Representative Yehovsky. Thank you so much. First, I want to thank all of the witnesses today for their work and for being here and for sharing parts of our Vermont and US history that at this point isn't widely taught in our schools. And for some of us, it may have been the first time we learned these things about slavery and, and our history. Um, so thank you for this. I agree wholeheartedly that slavery in all its forms must be abolished. And as you've pointed out, there is an exception in our 13th Amendment that has been widely exploited to routinely disenfranchise and, con and take away rights from many people, largely people of color. And I'm wondering if in your view, this amendment um, would close that gap and help give us a path to paying people who are incarcerated at the very least a minimum wage for their work. Match um, that is something that we don't want to get into. We're not here to talk about wages for people who are being forced to work. Our primary goal is to end the forcing you to work part. We don't want to say that we don't want inmates to be employed because there is a uh, system in the prisons where they need money to be able to do the things that they need to do. But that is a very separate conversation from forcing someone to do something against their will. And that is what we're focusing on, not the aspect of salaries or who should be paid or how much, but whether or not you can turn someone through ownership into a forced labor person. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I may. Go ahead, Reverend Hughes. <clears throat> Thank you. I would say for the, um, the, um, the representative's question in terms of um, what next, you know, I, I know we do have a tendency to kind of want to get out ahead of ourselves, and I, I, I understand the representative's passion. <clears throat> I think that, um, you know, at the stage that we're at right now, I think just getting the ball over the line here in, in this state and making sure that we join the states across the nation who are one by one expressing the same sentiment that slavery under any circumstance is prohibited. And, and I hope that... Um, I hope Vermont is actually one of the states that actually leads the effort in just really getting behind this, um, this national effort that's seeking to implement this 28th Amendment uh, that, um, the, um, that Max was speaking about. But as far as all of the ramifications, there will be many. There, there, are, there's, there are things that, because that's the definition of systemic racism, what we need to do is we need to unpack this thing. We we're already planning on coming back to this committee next session talking about what else in the Constitution needs to be undone, namely the title uh, of Chapter 42 in the Constitution that speaks about freemen. And that's a whole nother conversation. And I have a lot to share with you on that. But there's a lot to unpack here. And we have to figure out in what order we unpack it. So thank you for, um, thank you for that question, um, um, Madam Chair. And I think the representative is right to, to, uh, to be thinking in that direction. Thank you. Any other questions from committee members? Representative Colston. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm numb with trauma from these powerful testimonies. And as a black man, I'm so grateful for all of you shedding light to this truth. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Colston. Um, any other questions before we shift to the next witness? 
All right, seeing none, I wanna welcome Amanda Garces, who is with Vermont's Human Rights Commission. Um, and welcome, Amanda, and we would love to hear your thoughts on Prop 2. Thank you so much, um, uh, Chair and members of the community. My name is Amanda Garces, and I am the Director of Policy, Education, and Outreach for the Vermont Human Rights Commission. The HRC has jur jurisdiction over claims of discrimination in housing, state government employment, and places of public accommodation. The HRC achieves this mission by enforcing laws through investigation and litigation, conciliation disputes, educating the public, providing information and referrals, and advancing effective public policies on human rights. I am honored to be here and thank our legislators to consider this amendment. Thank you for your time, effort, and deliberation on PR2. This amendment is long overdue, and I appreciate all the community members who have brought this forth. And I want to appreciate Reverend Hughes' testimony today and everybody else. Um, what we need is very simple, is slavery in indentured servitude in any forms should be prohibited. The HRC strongly supports amendment the Vermont Constitution to eliminate all language relating to slavery. Slavery, Jim Crow laws, and the continuous disregard for African Americans has and will have lasted ramifications for generations to come. In our state, we grapple with policies and actions that disproportionately impact Black Vermonters. I would like for us to feel these statistics, which have been mentioned before. Vermont has the highest rate in the country of adult black male incarceration, and it has the third highest rate of incarceration for African-Americans overall. The percentage of blacks in Vermont prisons is 10 times the percent of blacks in the Vermont population. One out of every 14 black men are in prison. The Office of Civil Rights found in 2016 that black preschoolers are 3.6 times as likely to be suspended as white preschoolers. Black children represent 19% of preschoolers, but 47% of suspensions. In Vermont, we found that black and African-Americans were two to three times more likely than white students to be suspended in our schools. We grapple with all of this. African-Americans continue to experience hate crimes, bias incidents, racial profiling, and be discriminated against in employment, housing, schools, hospitals, and other places of accommodation. Over 30 years of studies and implicit bias tell us that we continue to discriminate against African-Americans in every aspect of our society. I want to turn our attention to a recent field called epigenetics. Scientists who study this find that trauma experienced by parents can impact generations to come. We need to support the healing process by acknowledging all the harms and removing this language from the constitution is a first step. Black Vermonters want this. And if we want any healing process to begin, we need to make this overdue change. We know about our Vermont exceptionalism mentality, but our data shows differently and that the injustices faced by African-Americans today are still here. For healing and repair to begin, we need to honestly acknowledge and take measurable steps towards building a restorative relationship with the descendants of slavery. Much has been made about the historical significance of maintaining the current language of the Constitution, but an amendment does not erase our history. Furthermore, if the majority of people who interpret the plain meaning of the Constitution as maintaining slavery for children, even if it's wrong because they're without the historical context that scholars and historians have. The amendment serves the purpose of eliminating this confusion. Um, I also, I am the chair of the Act One Working Group and we are working on continuing to push to, for, for histories to not be erased, leave, leave it up to their education 
uh, to keep that in the history. We don't need that in our constitution. Um, there are values that belong in the constitution, such as the right to free speech, marry, vote, bear arms. These are fundamental rights. And um, I know our executive director in the last session uh, spoke about about, uh, the, about the legality. So I can I'm just gonna bring up her testimony, read a couple of pages, just to um, make sure that I'm covering all the grounds. Um, and so she was encouraging the committee to eliminate all language after slavery in any form, as is any form is prohibited. And specifically, she talked about the language regarding the, the right to serve as an apprentice or be bound by law or payment of debts, damages, fine costs in the like constitution. Um, and we do not want to keep that language because retaining this language, you potentially give it greater weight than it originally had. In theory, a legal argument could be made that the right to serve as an apprentice or be bound by law or payment of debts, damages, fines, costs or the like was so important to our law lawmakers that his right should not be impeded by human trafficking laws, criminal statutes um, that define consent. Case law that will have rendered constructual terms null and void because it requires service that will be unconscionable or against public policy if enforced. So generally speaking, courts are very reluctant to order specific performance in routine Con contractual disputes. And then, um, so we suggest that the language regarding apprentices and contractual obligations do not belong here. So that's just the legal piece. And um, if you have further legal questions, we can ask our executive director. Um, but that is what I have today. I really hope that you kind of feel some of those statistics, some of the realities and that we see this as simple as it is to give our Black Vermonters a little bit of justice with these words. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Um, committee members, any questions for Amanda Garces? Excellent. Um, so I think it would be helpful to uh, to just talk a little bit about the process going. Oh, Representative Merwicki has a question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And it's not a question, but just a statement that I, I just want to affirm to, to all those witnesses that have put their heart and souls into sharing today that the lack of questions and, uh, is not a lack of interest and that this is a very important issue for us that we are looking to to move forward expeditiously on and uh, your your testimony is helping us uh, continue to push on for that so thank you so much to all of you that's a really good point to make representative Merwicki um, you know it is it is our role as a policy committee the uh, that we need to review um, a constitutional amendment and then be prepared to report it on the floor. And, um, and so having a good sense of, uh, of the history as well as a sense of um, the compelling rationale why we should move this forward is, is gonna be important when we take this in front of the entire house body. Um, and so the next step in our process is to hold a public hearing and um, at this moment in time, um, it is unclear from a standpoint of house rules, whether we will be um, resuming in-person legislating next week or whether we will um, continue remotely uh, given the surge in COVID cases. And so in order to plan for a public hearing, which we, um, which we are currently planning for the evening of the 20th, which is next Thursday, um, in order to plan for that safely, um, and I think probably for the convenience of Vermonters who may wanna weigh in on this, we're, we're gonna make sure that we have both in-person and remote options available when people uh, register. And so there is a, um, there's a press release that uh, 
I believe has already gone out, but I will um, check with my committee assistant to remind me if it um, if it has or hasn't gone out yet. Um, there's a there will be a registration link, and um, and folks can specify whether they intend to uh, join us remotely or in person. And I'll just add a caveat that. Um, in the event that um, house or joint rules declare that we will continue to work remotely for the next week, um, we will then need to have people join us remotely for the public hearing um, because the state house would uh, essentially be closed uh, because of the pandemic. And uh, yes, the, the public um, notice has gone out about the hearing next week, and it's on the General Assembly um, webpage. So, uh, if folks want to see the registration link, they can um, they can go there. Um, it's our intention to hear at the public hearing from anyone who wants to share their thoughts with us. Um, and in order to be sure that we make time for everyone who wants to share their thoughts, um, we're going to ask folks to to prepare remarks um, that, that fit into a three to five minute time slot. Um, but we will certainly uh, take in written form any testimony that people want to give that they are not able to in, in that time frame. Uh, Reverend Hughes. Um, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm sure that Ledge Council has already taken all things into consideration. However, I was wondering if during the course of a public hearing, if there was not a public space available, the legalities, uh, the ramifications surrounding that, whether or not that is something that we could actually pull off or whether um, we would need to wait until such time as there can be a place, and I, I see Emmerin coming in um, to do so. Uh, and if I could just follow up with that uh, answer, if, if possible. Uh, Amarin, um, revision of house rules during the pandemic um, and, and how that impacts our ability to hold a public hearing. Uh, since I'm returning, Amarin Average Daily Legislative Council, I will need to check with uh, Legislative Council Anderson um, as he is our open doors meeting expert um, and possibly with the clerk of the house to see how those uh, how those processes and legal requirements intersect as I am I'm unfortunately not an expert on, on that aspect, but I will look into that. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just, obviously at this stage in the game being, um, I think uh, Senator Ingram will appreciate this, being in the fourth quarter of the ball game uh, with this um, um, Go Georgia, with this uh, conversation on abolishing slavery, um, we, you know, we're very concerned that, you know, procedurally we don't, slip, uh, though, you know, obviously inadvertently, it, but we wanna make sure it's procedurally we're, we're going down the right path, you know, from this point, even to uh, the Secretary of State's office in terms of language and, and uh, you know, how this thing is framed, but definitely the, uh, we know constitutionally that this process is, is required, the, the hearing, public hearing, if in any way that that is, is uh, if there's any room that it, in which it could be negated, uh, our, our uh, actual uh, execution of that, uh, if it could be negated procedurally, then that would nullify all of the work that we've done in the last several years. So we're deeply concerned about that. Um, I also wanted to just ask that, um, you know, the those who are on and those who are watching would consider attending. Uh, if you go to our Facebook page tonight, we will also have an informational uh, community discussion on this uh, subject. Uh, and although um, Max Parthas doesn't know it yet, he's gonna be there and uh, we'll have some conversations about what's um, what's happening with this policy. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Merwicki. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'd like to put something forward for our committee to consider when we have this uh, public hearing that there have been situations before where I believe uh, the right thing for us to do is when testimony is offered that we allow for people of color to make the first testimonies in this hearing. And I would like our, our um, committee to think about this. This had come up before and I checked with uh, ledge council and there, there is nothing in our rules or in our law that would prohibit that from happening. 
And I think it would uh, certainly provide the perception that we especially want to hear from people of color on this if we allow them to testify first in, in, when we set up the lines for this. But just something for us to consider before we have this hearing. I, uh, I really appreciate that sentiment and, and uh, would agree that we, we certainly want to prioritize um, people of color in, in uh, being able to testify on this. Uh, we did not in creating the form that folks can fill out to register for the uh, public hearing, we did not put a field in that form that says, do you identify as a person of color? Um, and so if in the event that this uh, goes forward um, in some sort of hybrid or virtual format, um, it, it may be difficult to figure out who gets tapped to be first in line um, when, uh, when we don't necessarily know how people identify. So uh, we should chew on that a little bit and, um, and certainly want folks to know that, uh, that we uh, we'll, we'll hear from everyone who wants to testify on this constitutional amendment and uh, we'll do the best that we can to make sure that we're centering um, voices of our BIPOC neighbors. Uh, Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you very much uh, to all of you who testified today. It was very moving and informative. Uh, I think we ought to plan uh, to a um, go ahead with the 20th. I don't know that there's any reason not to, but to plan also that that will not be our only event. And that would allow us, as my colleague uh, from Putney has suggested, uh, to structure both the messaging and the execution of a subsequent hearing, um, pending whether or not it can be in, peer, in person or it has to be hybrid. I, I cannot believe that uh, even allowing three minutes per person, our time will be exhausted and there will be people who wish to testify, who will be unable to testify on the 20th. I, I can't believe that that wouldn't be the case. And I think we ought to just plan for a second event uh, and space it out so that if we are permitted to meet in person, so be it. Uh, if not, we still uh, will uh, leave no one who wants to testify, who is unable uh, to present his or her testimony. Thank you. I appreciate the sentiment, um, Representative Anthony. Um, we, uh, I'm, I'm sort of under the um, uh, under the the request of the speaker to move. Um, prop two to the floor uh, as expediently as possible. And uh, given the unpredictability of the virus and when it might be safe to hold an in-person public hearing, um, I, I guess I will defer back to her if she agrees that we should hold on to prop two um, long enough to have a, a, a second public hearing that might be in-person. Um, but uh, that is above my pay grade and, um, and also probably really difficult to predict. Um, so uh, appreciate the sentiment, but may not be able to, um, may not be able to do that. If I may, uh, just a, a, an observation, my understanding is so long as we pass this out and it appears on the November ballot, that's the way to enact it. Uh, I don't want to second guess, as you say, people above my pay grade, but frankly, uh, as long as it's passed out and it appears on the ballot, uh, that's the process that's outlined. Thank you. Yes, Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and I apologize for popping in now, and I've had some technical difficulties this morning myself, unfortunately. Um, I just have to say that a prior comment about speaking priority, um, my feeling is it desires more discussion, committee discussion. Okay, we can certainly make time for that. Um, so um, I believe that that is all the witnesses that we have for uh, Prop 2 this morning. And so 
I want to thank all of you for being with us this morning and um, for sharing a, a variety of, of different perspectives on both the history and uh, and sort of the uh, current implications of um, our constitution as it's written and, uh, and your thoughts on whether it ought to be changed. So thank you so much for being with us and please tune in for the public hearing next week.